Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, okay. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for attending the talk. I'm excited to talk to you guys today about real-time attribution with structured streaming and Databricks Delta. By means of introduction, uh, thanks to John for the intro. My name is Carol Juhas. I'm a solutions architect at Databricks. I've been here for about a year and a half. And prior to that, I was actually a product manager at an ad tech company called uh, MediaMath for the attribution team. So the reason I'm here today is because when we released Databricks Delta late last year, there was this light bulb moment that went off in my head, the part of my brain that still thinks about the challenges that came with running and maintaining and innovating against an attribution pipeline. Um, about all of the things that Databricks Delta could do to make the lives of the engineers I worked with so much easier. So my goal for today is to provide you guys with some tools and information about Databricks Delta that can help you build more real-time, lower latency attribution pipelines. And not just the real-time aspect, but to abstract away a lot of the overhead that comes with just maintaining the pipelines as they are. So the goal of today is not to go zero to 60 super quickly and have you developing sub-millisecond latency dashboards for all of your clients, populating with real-time attribution aggregated metrics. Um, most clients I talk to today, like I'd say 90% of them are um, you know, pretty early on. They're developing pretty uh, simple pipelines generally. It's something like a last touch model where you take a stream of something like conversions or clicks, some event of interest and tie it back to um, the very most recent touch point and just call it a one-to-one -one attribution. And the SLAs around that are still around 24 hours. So the data might be available to the organization in real time, but it's not actionable for the analysts or data scientists for 24 hours. So what I'm hoping to get to today is uh, take you through some of the features of Databricks Delta that kind of help get you from where you might be today closer and closer to something more uh, real time, allowing you to drive more value from that attribution data that you have in house. So there's a good chance that if you're in here, you know what attribution is. Um, but just to set a level playing field, we'll talk about it on two aspects or two layers. One is within the ad tech and marketing space. That's the use case that we're going to focus on today. Uh, attribution is generally the process for taking that event of interest, whether it's a conversion, a click, some engagement in an app, something like that, taking that ideal outcome and mapping it back to some touch points with your consumers that may have led to that eventual desired outcome. Uh, if you think about it, though, what, you're really, what you really have is two streams of some event-level data, some transactional feeds, and you're trying to take one and join it back to the other, often applying some kind of window and with varying complexity against that join. It's a pretty general use case. I think Dominic from Apple talked about uh, a similar use case for uh, identifying suspicious behavior, tying back to previous events that you, they saw on the same IPs. So it has a wide array of applications, gaming, IoT, but today we're going to hone in on uh, specifically an advertising and marketing type of use case. The second major component of my talk today is Databricks Delta. So some of you may be familiar about it. You heard it in the keynotes yesterday. If you're not familiar with it, uh, definitely watch the announcement from Spark Summit Europe last year and the demo that uh, Michael Armbrust did, and I thought it was uh, you know, pretty thorough. But we'll also obviously cover it today. So at a high level, Delta is a data management capability that brings data reliability and performance optimizations to your data lake. So it generally sits on top of blob storage, right? So that's a general data lake. But in the most common definition of your data lake, you're probably dumping a ton of this transactional data in there and then just praying it's going to be useful, however you kind of cut at it later on. Delta is meant to sort of make that uh, a lot easier that not have that pain fall on your shoulders of making sure it's ready for reads, uh, for analysts, for generating reports, um, for data science work. So let's get a little bit more tangible, tangible with that by looking at a typical stream to sync pipeline before Delta. This is probably kind of familiar to a bunch of you. You have a bunch of events streaming in, you put it through some messaging service like Kafka or Kinesis with Lambda architecture for doing you know, record by record or micro batch type validation, making sure that your record schemas match what the sync is actually expecting. It's not going to corrupt the data. 
Then there's some level of partitioning so that on the downstream piece of it, your consumers are able to you know, just look at the chunks of data that are relevant, not scan in everything. And then there's a performance piece that you have to think about because especially if you want this data available fresh, you're probably writing it pretty often. If you're writing it every 10 seconds or so or even every minute, depending on your throughput uh, or the volumes of data you're working with, you could end up with a ton of tiny files, which, as a lot of you know, ends up in really poor performance when you're trying to read against that data. So you have to introduce some compaction process. Now, for a typical you know, blob store or a typical data lake, if you're going to compact, you're basically reading all of that in and then rewriting it, and you have to make sure that no one's trying to read at the same time that you're doing this read and rewrite. So then you have to worry about uh, scheduling it at a time where you're not expecting consumers to use it, and that means coordination on your part, overhead for maintaining that compaction piece, and then downtime for your consuming, appli consuming applications or users. So what Delta does is it basically says, okay, we'll take, we'll put Spark on the end of that messaging service, on the end of that stream, and then just dump it into Databricks Delta, which is, again, really just a, like a protocol, a layer on top of that blob store that abstracts away a lot of that uh, kind of messy stuff we were looking at in the previous slide. You can stream straight into Delta. At that same time, users can go ahead and plug into the data. They have it available at that low latency within seconds as you're you know, records come in, dump on, you know, S3 or Azure Blob or something like that. Your analysts can actually run SQL queries against it and everything's totally fine. We'll do schema validation for, on that, uh, on Delta as that data is coming in. And then if you wanted to optimize, right, let's say compact those files while all of this is happening, maybe you've had this running for 24 hours and you know you have a ton of small files in there, you can run that optimize command. It's just a simple API. It says optimize table. And while people are reading from it, while data, more data is streaming into it, you're actually um, you know, doing that compaction job without impacting anything. It's still all transactional and ACID compliant and consistent f across your reads. The other thing we're going to introduce here, and we'll talk about it a little more, is the idea of sort of indexing and clustering the data within your data lake so that you don't rely solely on partitions to have to scan in a subset of your data. Right, so there, I mean, you can still use partitions. That's definitely still an option, and a lot of clients who are using Delta still do. But now you also have this option for z-ordering, Z which just sort of co-locates co -locates data um, on a multi-dimensional basis. So you can specify multiple columns. Obviously, like, the efficacy of that kind of decreases with the more columns that you have. Um, but the other great thing about Delta is that you can really point um, you can point your data into multiple different tables and have it optimized for uh, different kinds of reads. So we'll look at an example of that as well. So backing up a bit, let's look at what attribution looks like at the actual data level, right? We have some transactional log of impressions uh, here. This is just, you know, assuming I served an ad on a certain publisher. And then we have conversions. So this is an actual purchase made, maybe some value associated with that purchase and you're doing some kind of join. The join is where the fun stuff lives, okay? In the attribution world, uh, we'll talk about it a little more in the next slide, but the, in the attribution world, there is some pressure, especially in advertising, to get more sophisticated with that. Um, and you can imagine the same applies for things like the security or more general use cases. You don't wanna see some suspicious activity and then just simply go back to the very last time we saw that IP and call it a day, right? We probably wanna analyze some more sophisticated uh, behaviors, time series data against that IP or maybe connected IPs. Um, so same thing in advertising. You don't, if you think about yourself as a consumer, you don't know exactly, you, you didn't just buy something on a website because of the very last ad that you saw. Um, the way someone I used to work with uh, said, or you know, talked about this is, let's say you're walking into a Best Buy to buy a TV and someone hands you a flyer right as you walk in, you don't wanna attribute it to the guy standing outside if you already had that intent to purchase. Um, and you know, research has shown a lot of value in getting more sophisticated about looking at the behaviors and activities of a user before, um, before purchase. So we wanna introduce some complexity here to the join piece, but historically it's been tough, right? It's tied to the ETL job. You're doing one batch process. If you wanna iterate on it, it's kind of a painful, heavy, heavy duty job that you have to iterate on and kind of validate. 
So uh, we'll talk about how Delta makes this a lot easier and doesn't put the onus on you as a data engineer, right? You can actually just say, hey, you know what? Here are the raw data sets, have at it. Go for it, analysts, go for it, product managers, test out different attribution models. I don't care, my job is done here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so at the, at the bottom of that join, right, the ideal thing is you have some, the, the first layer of it anyways, you have some attributed impressions, which will generally contain that desired output and joined to uh, the touch points that you think led to that output based on your model. But what are some of the challenges? So we talked a bit about the complexity in the previous slide. We also obviously have a scale, uh, scale concern. A lot of companies, a lot of you guys that are dealing with this today aren't just looking at you know, a few hundred, few thousand rows and doing this join locally on your machines. It could be millions or billions, sometimes even trillions of data points right, that you're looking at within the attribution window that you want to look at. And then, again, back to the complexity, while most of the logic, most of the join logic out there is probably pretty straightforward, you know, there's some pressure to get more sophisticated and more interesting with it, uh, and it's hard for a data engineer to allocate the time to build pipelines just to test out, you know, the, the kind of coordination that you need between your data engineering team, your analysts, your scientists, and your product managers can be just too overwhelming uh, and too much of a tax to really make it worth it until Delta. So uh, what, the example that we'll look at today is I'm basically simulating an impression stream and a conversion stream, pumping that through Kinesis. We'll plug that into Spark Structured Streaming um, and then look at some example. We're not actually gonna go all the way to the right there and plug in BI tools, but that's definitely something you can do. We're just gonna interact from the notebook as if it is like the SQL layer. Okay, so if we go back to you know, what the data looks like, let's take this up a level instead of this Excel sheet looking thing and see what it looks like actually in the, within the infrastructure. You have some uh, streaming data coming in. You have your impression stream separately from your conversion stream. And here with Delta, we're just gonna dump it into the data lake. Because that data is immediately queryable, you can just run views on top of it. You can generate unmaterialized views on top of that data with any arbitrary kind of join logic, filters, attribution windows, you name it. Uh, you could create that and then just expose it to you know, SQL analysts so they can run their queries against it. And what that's gonna do is go back to the source every time. So if anything changes, right, we add more data, we add more data, this, is, this data is still streaming into the sink. When they run that view, the query on the view, they're gonna get the very latest information. The other thing we can do is sort of chain together delta tables and stream from one to another. And let's say someone played around with some views and decided, okay, this is the one we wanna move forward with for this particular client or this particular uh, you know, sub subset. Can we generate a persistent table? so that uh, we don't have to generate the view every time, so that's more efficient, it's more performant. Uh, so you can also you know, take these two and then spin them off into persistent uh, data that's sitting on you know, your blob store that has this interactive SQL uh, like layer on top of it. Okay, and before we dive into the demo, this is what we're gonna actually look at uh, as the example. So as I mentioned earlier, Kinesis into structured streaming, which is gonna be through Databricks hosted, uh, hosting Spark on, on EC2 machines. Structured streaming writes to Delta, which is really just on top of, in this case, S3 using Parquet format. And then we can kind of just iterate on that. As we, in that previous example we talked about, where we're actually gonna create a persistent Delta attribution table, you know, we're just using Spark to write back into, uh, you know, another Delta table. So without further ado, let's get on into it. Okay, so this is uh, the Databricks notebook environment. I have my cluster up and running, I have my streams going. So we can see we have the impression and conversion streams here. And let's go ahead and see the data update. So I just ran this a little bit ago, so we should see this number um, update in real time. I've predefined this table, Spark Submit Imps, simply by you know, doing a create table statement. Spark Submit, Spark Submit, using Delta and then specifying a location. So the location that I used is 
the sync for these streams. So there was already data sitting in there. So before I started these streams, I did a query against that data set. And you'll see there, was our, there were already 23 million rows in there, kicked off the stream. So now we're writing data on top of that every five seconds. So we're ending up with a bunch of small files, which we can later compact over time. But this data is now immediately available. And as this data gets populated, this count increases. Let me make it bigger for you guys. All right. So one way we can look at this is looking at you know, the most recent data. We can identify um, you know, new data streaming in by looking at the, the data in order of decreasing timestamp. So we'll see that update. And then we'll get a bit more interesting with it. So um, as I mentioned, there are a few ways that we can kind of materialize this attributed data set now that we have the streams running. We can create views, so that's the first thing we're going to do. That's going to be the least amount of overhead for you as a data engineer, is to say, okay, I have these source tables. I'm just going to point references to those source tables and give you the keys to exercise further logic or exercise your own custom logic against these source tables. So you don't actually have to worry about pre-aggregating the data and making sure it's persistent and materialized. So what that looks like is here we've just defined a window function. So we're taking that impressions data and we're creating a window function here over the user and the advertiser ID. So for any given conversion, it's associated with an advertiser ID, we want to find the last time that advertiser uh, targeted that user. Right here, we're just doing last touch. So we want to find the very last time. So we're creating windows in the impression zone where we're in the impression log where we're trying to find all those users and that advertiser ID interaction. And then we're using a window function to take the most recent one of those. In this case, we're using dense rank. Okay, so we're doing this join directly on that data as it's updating. And what's happening here, um, for those of you who are familiar with Spark, we're not actually persisting the data. Again, it's just references and pointers. It's just a view on top of those uh, on top of those tables. So anyone can query this data and it'll, this table or this view, and it'll get the most recent data. So here we're looking for the last conversion. What's happening under the hood, right, is conversions are streaming in. We're trying to take the most recent conversion and find the most recent impression that's associated with that same user and that same advertiser. And that's what's going to populate below. But it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, there are certain ways to optimize this. Uh, we could certainly run the optimize command on the back end to make sure that the files are uh, already compacted. Uh, we could increase our cluster size. Um, and then, of course, the views are going to have to process the raw data from scratch. So the next layer, this will complete in an, a number of seconds. In this case, I'm using an eight-node cluster. It took about 30 seconds to do that attribution process on the latest set of data. Well, the full set of data, really, um, where it's just rendering the most recent. But we could certainly speed that up, again, by persisting that data. So in addition to uh, creating a view, as it's populating, as we're writing, in this first example, we're just taking that impression stream, we're taking the conversion stream, and we're writing every record by record directly into storage. We could actually do the attribution on the stream. So in this case, we're taking the conversion stream, and for every conversion that happens, for every record, we're going to go and do the join, and then we could go ahead and write that out and persist that as a table, as a delta table, which can then be compacted again and again over time. So as you can see here, you know, this is just one notebook. I've just started a stream of impression and conversion data, and I can try different models. I can try different approaches for how to apply that attribution, how to get those insights back. Um, we've only looked at last touch so far, but we could simply easily go to weighted attribution here. Um, where in, I'm just adding an additional step in my window function to weight every impression based on how many impressions were served prior to 
uh, prior to the conversion. So for example, if I as an advertiser showed five impressions and then somebody made a purchase, I'll allocate the purchase value across the five impressions that we shown equally. You can get more and more sophisticated with that too, right? You could actually weight it by time. Um, you could take a diff of the time of conversion and the time of impression and weight uh, the most recent impressions more highly than the ones that were further away. So those are just a few examples of the attribution process here. A couple of other things that I wanted to call out um, are Z ordering. So what does that look like? We talked about this a little bit earlier. So this is basically giving you a lever for clustering and co-locating data depending on the queries that you expect against that attributed data set or against the raw data set. So in one example, I've uh, optimized my table by advertiser, and another, I've optimized it by just user ID. So if you look at the query times for one versus another, you'll see that if I'm querying against advertiser, it'll go a little bit faster, uh, and depending on the kind of query and the structure of the data, often significantly faster when you've z-ordered by advertiser ID than when you've z-ordered by UID. And the reason, again, for this is that since we've co-located the data, and we have indexing on the files. We basically calculate file statistics for every file in your data lake. So if there are files where the advertiser ID range is irrelevant, we're going to completely ignore those files in the scan. So that's where the power of this really comes in. Because that data is co-located, we only have to look at a much smaller fraction of the files to begin with. Now, some of you are also dealing with issues for late arriving data. So this is great. Uh, you know, Delta is great because you don't actually have to hold anything in state to do these joins. You know, there, there was an option if you wanted more real-time attribution to have a streaming application, hold your impressions in memory, hold your conversions, or, and when your conversions come in, you do the join against the in-memory table on impressions, but then either you know, you're bottlenecked because you don't want to hold 7, 30 days of transactional data, or it just becomes expensive and inefficient. So, uh, you know, that's addressed by having the data just land uh, directly into your data lake or into Databricks Delta. We also have upsert support um, for corrected data, right? So if, if data arrives late to begin with, it's already addressed by the fact that, you know, it's, uh, it's not in a, in a state. We're not going to miss it because we're only reading a small amount of data or whatever we're holding in memory. We're actually still reading across the full table. So even if data's late, let's say an impression shows up later than a conversion was registered, but that impression was served prior to the conversion, we'll still register that as soon as that impression gets, gets uh, written to the table. And then for upserts or, or data corrections, we have upsert support. So if something changes about a given record that has already been written, you can only look at that file, make that change, and we'll just, you can only look for that record or for files that match a certain predicate or set of conditions. We'll only take those files, rewrite them, edit them, and then once that uh, upsert is complete, all of your future queries against those tables and views of attribution on top of that data source will be consistent with that corrected data. All right. So um, to wrap up, you know, there are ways that we can definitely, we, there is a lot to cover with uh, you know, this whole problem, this whole challenge. There are a lot of different uh, ways to approach it. One thing we didn't really get to talk about too much is optimizing performance. Um, so one of, one of the levers you have there is underlying, optimizing the underlying store using things like optimize, Z order, actually putting partitions where you know they're going to flow through to pretty much every uh, kind of analytics that you're going to do against that table. Uh, we didn't really uh, leverage this too much in this example, in this demo, but there's also a built-in parquet caching for, or a built-in um, cache to cluster on our SSDs for reading from Delta. So what that means is if I, as an analyst, run an attribution model against a certain set of data and another user, a data scientist, wants to do train a model based off that same set of data while they're both using the cluster, that second use of the data will only read from the cluster SSD. You don't have to go all the way back out to uh, your blob store to read that data in. You're actually increasing performance tremendously because once you've read it once on the cluster, you only have to read it from the cluster again, read it locally again. 
Um, and then the last thing we mentioned a bit, data skipping. So that's what allows you to really limit the file scans and the data that you're reading directly from uh, your, your data lake. The other things that we've sort of talked about, you know, optimizing based on your cluster size, making sure you have the right compute to do the job, um, and then joining on stream and persisting that data so that instead of recalling the full view um, and calculating all of the attribution and doing all the joins from source, you're already just doing the query off of pre-attributed and aggregated data. And then with handling complexity, again, because you're persisting all of that data, you can treat it like just batch data that's sitting in a data lake. You have full flexibility to um, you know, fork streams, um, create lots of different kinds of delta tables. Um, and then for latent corrected data, we have upserts and views as well to support those use cases that are currently really you know, a pain because you have to rewrite full partitions whenever you have to update uh, incorrect or late data. So with that, those were the main things that I wanted to show you guys. Delta introduces a unifi unification of batch and streaming. Uh, we have e easy APIs for managing performance, like optimize and z-order. Uh, we allow flexible and scalable analytics on near real-time data, so you can put more of the power to do things like complex joins in the hands of your downstream consumers. And with that, I'll stop for questions. Yes. Nice talk, thank you. Uh, so I'm curious on, on two things. First, is this um, methodology used in production? On you, you mentioned Media Math at the beginning, or, or any other uh, kind of ad tech company. And secondly, um, for the scenario in which uh, stuff is not running on Databricks, would you recommend the, the structured streaming, the stateful structured streaming approach for storing the impressions and the conversions for the attribution to happen? Got near real time? Yeah, great questions. Um, so I think for that second one, that definitely opens up more options, right? That could give you lower latency or better performing queries if you, with the scalable state store, allows you to persist a lot more without having to uh, read from all the way from disk. You have that in memory quick store. Um, and yeah, we do have some clients who are doing very similar things, not a, this exact pipeline, um, but conceptually and fundamentally doing the same, same workflow in production today. Good question. Yes. So, uh, um, the f first, is it possible to um, to run Databricks Delta outside of Databricks platform? Oh, unfortunately, no. It is exclusive to Databricks. Um, mm -hmm. But hopefully, this gives you some ideas about some of the things that you could build yourself that we've heavily invested in as well. Okay. And second, uh, is it feasible to to run a a Spark cluster somewhere, let's say, on Microsoft Azure, in, in Microsoft Azure Cloud, and have, at the same time, have access to Databricks Delta? Yes, yes. So uh, there is Azure support for Delta today, and we, and we are a first-party service within Azure. Okay, but but um, performance-wise, is it feasible? Uh, performance-wise, is it feasible? Um, yes. So I think there are slight differences with the mechanics, um, but yeah, essentially the same thing. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, Paul Kostinsky, Trade Desk. So I'm curious about your uh, example with late, late arrivals. So you recommend using absurd. Uh, so if, if late arrivals are frequent, you will frequently rewrite same SM files. So mm -hmm. How will Delta optimize performance versus aggregation, which I would use, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. We have clients that have just started coming to us with this sort of high frequency, high volume upsert use case. It's something that we're testing the scale of. So far, we've seen, I think, in the 10,000 per second, or yeah, 10,000 per second range in testing, um, but TBD on what that sort of threshold looks like for us today. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, good question. It's upsert. Uh, only supported in file format right now? Um, I'm sorry, as opposed to? As to other data sources, like the storage level? Yeah, yeah, so I think it's, at, it's the atomicity is just at the file level. Everything in Delta is just files sitting in a data lake. And so when you do emerge into, um, we have, like the most granular we can get is file level. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hey. 
Oh, sorry about that. I missed the right side of yeah. the room. Thanks. Great talk. Um, I have a question concerning the join and uh, what happens when, such as you have uh, one customer that's a bot that's had 10,000 impressions or whatnot, like, is this a problem that you've encountered in your previous experience here? And uh, how are you taking steps to solve it? Is this a question on skew, skewed data? Yeah, so I think that's one of the great things about Delta. For example, you don't have to partition by advertiser ID. You could simply lean on Z ordering. Yeah. All right. Let's give Carol a Thank big you hand. Guys. Thank you. Thanks very much.